Well, good evening, and welcome to the Wednesday Night Bible Study. Uh, we are studying the book of Genesis, and I'm really glad uh, and excited that you've decided to, uh, to listen in and to participate. I want to encourage you that if you have a Bible, that you'd grab your Bible and that you'd follow along. You may even want to grab a pen and a paper and make some notes. Uh, you may want to uh, write down some questions, things of that nature. Um, but I think we're going to have a blessed evening. And I, I just pray that this is uh, something that encourages you and that helps you to grow and mature in the, the knowledge and the wisdom of God's Word. And I also pray that there's some practical applications uh, within this study for you that you can kind of implement in your life. All right, so last week we began looking at uh, the life of Joseph again. In chapter 38 of the book of Genesis, we had a little bit of a detour. Uh, we had looked at uh, the life of uh, Judah, and we saw his interaction with uh, a woman named Tamar. And again, I had mentioned this last week, but it, um, it seems like a little bit of a departure. Um, and in some ways it is, right? We, we've not, we're not looking at the life of Joseph in that chapter. Uh, but there are some connections. There are some things and some reasons for why that story is where it is. But last week we began looking at chapter 39. In chapter 39, we again look at the life of Joseph. And, and Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers. And they sold them to some Ishmaelites and they were going down into Egypt. We, they get down into Egypt and they, are, they sell Joseph to a man named Potiphar. Now Potiphar is an officer, the captain of Pharaoh's guards. And so he's a man of importance and definitely has the, uh, the money for uh, more slaves, things of that nature. He's, he's got a, a enough wealth. So the man has, I'm sure, multiple, multiple slaves. And we saw early on in the text that after a little while, Potiphar recognized that there was something different about Joseph, that Joseph was blessed. And it says uh, that Potiphar recognized that the Lord was with him. And we talked a little bit about well, that doesn't necessarily mean that Potiphar knew uh, the Lord by name, but he certainly knew that there was something special about Joseph, and he knew that he was being blessed, that his um, uh, all that was put in charge of Joseph, everything that was under Joseph's charge and control was really just blessing. So, uh, was being blessed. So Potiphar just uh, left everything in Joseph's hands. Uh, all right, let's begin now. We're going we're gonna to see um, the rest of the story here. We're going to look at verses 11 through 18. So chapter 39, 11 through 18. And it says, it says, but one day, this is speaking about Joseph, but one day, when he was, uh, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she, that is Potiphar's wife, she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had fled, uh, that, sorry, that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house. She called out to the men of the household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me. And I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. And she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought among us came into me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. All right, so, you know, we said last week, and uh, things we looked at, the, t the temptation which Joseph faced here was a constant temptation. It was a daily temptation over and over and over again, day in and day out. He is being tempted 
by this woman, Potiphar's wife, to have sexual relations. And again, there may be some other things going on uh, with this temptation. There might be some other implications. Um, he may be able to gain his freedom or something along those lines if he does have relations with this woman. Now, now here in verses 11 through 18, we see that Potiphar's wife, she finally gets a good opportunity. She finally gets a hold of Joseph and she makes her move, right? The, um, the text emphasizes that they were in the house alone. She was in the house. Joseph came in to do his work. They're in the house together. They're in the house alone. No one else is there. There's no other servants there. She's got her opportunity. And of course, we could say Joseph has his opportunity too. He could give in to temptation. Um, nobody's around. Nobody would know. So she takes this opportunity and she makes her move. And Joseph, he stands firm. He stands firm and he continues to be faithful. He continues to remain faithful to God. He resists her advances and he leaves. Now, he leaves in a hurry. Um, and when he leaves in a, in, a, in a hurry, what does he leave behind? Well, he leaves behind his coat, right? His, his, his garment. He leaves, he leaves behind an identifying garment there. And she's going to hold on to it. It says she laid it up beside herself, right? Um, he left his garment there and she laid it up beside herself. She's not letting go of this. She is, she's upset, right? Here's one of the interesting things that um, we could think about just for a moment. I think it's interesting to note that we see this, this concept of a coat or a cloak or some kind of an outer garment in Joseph's life a number of times. Uh, we, we saw earlier in the life of Joseph when his father gave him a coat of many colors that uh, his brothers, when they finally decided that they were going to sell him off into slavery, they were going to get rid of him, they took the coat off of him, right? And they doused it in, in animal blood to show their father. But they strip him of his robe. They strip him of his coat of many colors. And here, again, we see this innocent man. He is stripped, in a sense, of his outer garment here, this, this cloak or this coat. You know, this woman, she grabs him and ends up uh, that Joseph leaves behind his coat. His coat is, in a sense, stripped from him again. We'll, we'll see some other, um, we'll, we'll see this concept of the coat or the cloak or some kind of an outer garment show up again in Joseph's life. But interesting, keep, keep an eye on that. Keep, uh, think about that. And, and we'll talk about it uh, at a later uh, time in a later study. But just notice this concept of this outer garment is being lost a number of times. Now, uh, now that Joseph has run away, what does this woman do? Well, first of all, she gets angry. She's upset and she yells, she screams. She's angry that Joseph has left her high and dry once again. And she gets upset with that. She yells out, but she also makes up some lies. What do we have here? We have a well, well, we have a sinful woman, a wicked woman, but she's a woman scorned. She's been rejected a number of times over and over again. Um, and she's kind of had it. I've had it up to here. I'm done. And she's scorned for the final time. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. And now we're going to see what happens in the next few verses. So let's look at verses 19 through 23. So... 19 says, as soon as his master, that's Joseph's master, so Potiphar, as soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge, 
because the Lord was with them. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. All right, so what does Potiphar do when he comes home and his wife tells him this story? Well, he's angry. You know, we, we could think about it in a number of ways. He's, he's upset. Here's a, a, a young man that he's put in charge of everything, and now he has these issues to deal with. Um, he, could be, he could be angry about the fact that he has to do something with Joseph now, but, you know, Joseph was his lucky charm, wasn't he? He was his good luck charm, and everything that was done... Um, in Potiphar's house was blessed, it prospered uh, because of Joseph and because of the one who was behind Joseph who was, was working all these things. Uh, and so Potiphar's angry and he ends up putting Joseph in prison. Notice that the prison though, he doesn't just put him in any prison, he puts him in the prison where the king's serve, uh, uh, prisoners are kept. It seems to be that there's some kind of a distinction here. This just this wasn't just any kind of um, prison, wasn't any kind of a pit. They probably had ones for common folk, but here is where the king, the pharaoh, you know, puts his prisoners. So interesting. Now let's ask a question: Does does Potiphar believe his wife? Well, we're not going to be able to answer that a hundred percent conclusively, right? M maybe he does. But he might not trust her. Uh, that, that may be as well. You know, if we think for a moment, if he believed that his, uh, if he believed the story that his wife tells, and, and if he believed her that, that Joseph tried to rape her, basically that's what's being talked about here, that here is this slave who tries to rape his wife, right? This is a big deal. This is not, you know, this is nothing to just brush under the rug. This is a big deal. Um, it would have brought shame and reproach upon her, but on Potiphar as well and the whole household. So here's the question. Why, if he believes his wife, why didn't he just have him killed? Why wouldn't he just kill Joseph? After all, he's the captain of the guard. And, and even if he needed to ask Pharaoh's permission, it's unlikely that Pharaoh would care. I mean, this, this Joseph is a nobody, right? He's a foreign slave. Who cares about this guy? Pharaoh has other things that are much more important. It's very likely that uh, the captain of the guard would have had the, the right to, uh, to take out capital punishment on whoever he saw fit anyways. Um, well, at least people who weren't, let's say, in the, uh, um, the service, direct service of, of Pharaoh. But um, he doesn't. Now, again... I don't know for sure, but I'm leaning towards the possibility that um, Potiphar might know what kind of woman this is. She may very well have done similar kinds of things. Um, you know, when somebody's when somebody's doing some shifty things, some some deceptive, deceitful things. You know, a lot of times you may not have hard evidence, but there's just something just doesn't seem right. So. In my mind, anyways, I, I lean towards this possibility that, that Potiphar is angry, but he's, he may very well be angry with his wife. Um, or he might not be sure. He might not be sure if Joseph really did try to do this or if he can trust his wife. Not really sure, but I do find it strange that he doesn't just kill Joseph right off the bat. Uh, we could say, well, it's God's providence. Sure, God's providence is working behind the scenes, but I, I still don't know that that accounts for the fact that um, Potiphar doesn't want to have him killed. And he puts Joseph in a, what seems to be a special prison, a prison where it's not just your average everyday criminals. This is where Pharaoh's prisoners go. And that's still a pit, right? It's still, it's still a prison. It's still like a dungeon, but it's a, maybe a step up something along those lines. So anyways, Joseph gets sent into prison. And what happens while he's there? Well, the, the Lord is with him and everything that Joseph touches prospers. God is blessing Joseph regardless of where he is. And he's blessing people around him. Remember, we talked last week about people who come in contact with God's people. If they come into close fellowship, close relationship with God's people, a lot of times they are blessed. 
even if they never become Christians or, or never follow God, um, a lot of times they receive some kind of an overflowing of a blessing. God is blessing his people, and through his people, he ends up blessing others. And people who are in close proximity often get those blessings. We talked about Abraham being given that uh, promise that whoever blesses Abraham, God was going to bless, those kinds of things. And, and here again, I think we're seeing some, some things. Um, God is working in the midst of sorrows and sufferings in Joseph's lives. Uh, and people are seeing it, and people are benefiting from Joseph being around. So even though Joseph is um, still being blessed by God, though, and God is still with him, do you think that if that were you, that you might get discouraged? Do you, do you think that you might even get depressed, maybe? I mean, you, first of all, are sold off into slavery. You end up in uh, the house of, of a man named Potiphar, and you're put in charge of everything, and you know that this is a, a, a great privilege. Um, God is with you. There's blessings happening all over the place. Even the, even the master recognizes that you're someone special because someone behind you, right? God is doing something through you. But then you're accused. You stay faithful, you stay righteous, you stay holy uh, to God and his commands, and, and you do the right thing, and yet you find yourself in a worse situation. Now you find yourself in prison, in a dungeon. And do you think you might get discouraged? You know, I've gone from the frying pan into the fire. If it were me, I think I might. I think I might get discouraged. I think I might wonder, where are you, God? Why have you allowed this to happen to me? Why do you continue to allow this to happen to me? Not, not only have I been put into slavery, but now I'm put into prison and I've done absolutely nothing deserving of prison. I'm innocent and I don't deserve this. Listen, just because a person is a servant of God doesn't mean that troubles in life won't affect them. It doesn't mean that when they go through hard times, listen, it doesn't mean that when a, a godly person, someone who is a Christian, someone who is following God, it doesn't mean that when you go through hard times, that even harder times aren't around the corner. They might be. We might be feeling like we're in the frying pan at this point, and we remain faithful. That doesn't mean that even harder times aren't coming. Now, now listen, I know that doesn't sound very encouraging, but it's true. We see it in the life of Joseph here. We can, we can probably think back and see it in our own lives, where we were going through hardships and trials. We were remaining faithful. We were praying for God uh, to bless us, to help us, to strengthen us, to move us through these difficult times, and things got even worse. But what do we remember? God is with Joseph, and God is with his people. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Right? I think we all know the end story of Joseph, don't we? The ending story, most of us have already read this story. We already kind of know where it's going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil it for you if, you if you don't know the story. Yeah, and we'll work, we'll work our way through it. But Joseph, he ends up getting out of prison. And he ends up having a pretty blessed life in the end, right? He goes through some hard times, but he gets out. And we might be tempted to think that God will bring us through all the trials, all the hardships, as long as we hold on to him and remain faithful. And that's true but not always the way we think or the way we want. Our story may not end the same way that Joseph's did. It, it may be that we go through hard times and hardships and all of that, and they get worse, and God delivers us, but maybe not the same way he delivered Joseph. You know, there's another story in the Scriptures. There's another very righteous man, servant of God, who was faithful to God. He was even privileged to announce the coming of the Messiah, to announce the coming of Jesus. His name was John the Baptist, and he ended up getting put in prison for a while. And you know, 
God delivered him out of that prison. But it wasn't, it wasn't the same way as Joseph. It was through death that he was delivered out of that prison. John the Baptist was beheaded while he was in prison. Now, I do think that we should see that as God rescuing John. It just isn't what we might like to think about or what we might not want for ourselves. But listen, if, if it's true that this world is not our home, we're just passing through, then the greatest victory is not to be released from daily troubles and pressures and, and go on to continue this, this life that we experience here and now, but really the greatest victory would be to receive what John the Baptist received, and that is to be rescued and to go off into glory. Again, that ta that's, a, that's a hard teaching, and, and that takes a, a mindset that says, this world is not the end-all be-all of the Christian existence, that, that there's something far better than this. There's something far better than this, right? We pray for people to get, to get well. We, we, we pray, Father, uh, bring, bring about healing and health in the life of this person who has cancer or, or pneumonia or, or COVID or whatever it is. And, and we pray for that and we want that. And, and, and sometimes God brings about health and healing in their life. However he does it, he brings it about and we rejoice and we're grateful for that. But sometimes he rescues that person, but not by bringing about physical health, by taking them home to him, by taking them off to glory. And that is the greater victory. I just don't think we sometimes think about that. So anyways, in the life of Joseph and in the life of John the Baptist, we can see two people of God who are striving to, to worship and, and, and honor God and do all that. And both of them have struggles and trials in life. God is with both of them. And in the end, they both are rescued, but they are both rescued in different ways. They both receive, well, they both receive release from prison, but they receive it in different ways. Well, I think we're going to stop there uh, for this week, and I pray that it's been a blessing to you, and I hope that you'll join us again next week as we continue to work through uh, the book of Genesis here, and we see more of the life of Joseph. God bless you.